Just a quick introduction on our guest tonight. Um, Dr. Keanu Sai holds a PhD in political science specializing in Hawaiian constitutionalism and international relations and is a founding member of the Hawaiian Society of Law and Politics. He served as the agent for the Hawaiian Kingdom in arbitration proceedings before the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague, Netherlands in November 99 through February 2001 as a, and as an agent in the complaint against the United States of America concerning the prolonged occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom filed with the United Nations Security Council in 2001. Dr. Sai's articles on the status of the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state, the arbitration case and complaint filed with the United Nations Security Council have been published in the American Journal of International Law, Chinese Journal of International Law, and the Hawaiian Journal of Law and Politics. Um, before I do turn this over, I just realized I skipped the opening pule. So um, that was the intro for Dr. Sai. I'm going to have um, Pele come in and open us in pule, and then I'll turn it over right to you, Dr. Sai. Pele, kalamai. No, I'll leave Mahalo. Um, mahalo nui, aloha kako. Uh, and yes, let's. We're very blessed to have um, Dr. Sai again. Aloha ho. Um, and also, I just wanted to say before the pule, how much I enjoyed meeting a lot of your um, keiki um, when we had our training and um, homo because they are very, very, very delightful um, you to work with. So, eh, um, uh, I kuhi ia mai mako pehea e ho, holomuai maki au um, kia um, vani. No leila i nga wahane hawa mako e hui kalamai o ia mako e kia kua. Ko kua mai a mako i loko o kia ahi ahi a me nga wae hiki mai ana um, ma ka um, hoi kai kana ma loka pova vai ka ike na ono ko mako mo au ka, ka ike o na kupuna a me ka hana e hana i maka holomuai o kia ka Pulea pulea oe, maka inu o kamakua ki keiki a me ka uhane e molele. Amene. Mahalo nui. Amene. Mahalo. Um, uh, and so just in case, guys, you um, you didn't, you wasn't on last weekend. Um, um, just want to kind of a little bit disclaimer out there. Tonight, Dr. Sai, and then throughout this whole series, he's going to touch on some topics that may not be familiar to uh, some of us, um, and going certainly um, should certainly cause a reaction. What that reaction might be may differ um, by individual, but I guarantee you it will challenge the the norms and will cause you to question, and, uh, and that's okay, yeah. So without further ado, Dr. Keanu Sai. Hello, Bernie. Uh, don't mind the cookie frogs behind me. I'm up in close to Volcano Big Island. And it's small kind rainy. <laughs> so uh, so what I covered last week, right? Well, not last week, but the last session, it was really getting into terminology. So for myself as a political scientist, I'm not Hawaiian studies. My master's and my PhD is in political science. My undergrad was in sociology, right? So my approach to this, Hawaii's history, is infused with political science theory and understanding law, but also have a military background. So I served 10 years as an Army Field Artillery Officer. So that also honed my skills on addressing things. So when I'm, when I'm presenting to you folks here, I'm not trying to convince you that this is the way it is. I'm just explaining to you what it is, <laughs> right? So it's not an issue of do I have to agree or don't agree. Uh, information that I do share is self-evident. And the terminology and the definition I use are what is used, you know, 
at the level of either at the international or domestic levels. So one thing that we need to understand about the country called the Hawaiian Kingdom, not the sovereignty group who claims to be many different kingdoms. I'm talking about the country that my great grandparents were born into, right? So my great grandparents, my tutu's parents on both my mom and dad's side were born in the 1880s. They were born in a country called the Hawaiian Kingdom, not the kingdom of Hawaii, not the kingdom of Atui, right? But in a country called the Hawaiian Kingdom. And my doctoral dissertation really zeroed in on exactly what is the Hawaiian Kingdom. And I noticed I said, what is not what was, because that country still exists. So let me go to share screen. And I want to show you something. So, uh, Bernie, can you see this on my desktop? I can. Okay. So if you type type in Hawaiian Kingdom Permanent Court of Arbitration, this will pop up. Now, this basically covers cases that came before the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the Netherlands. Okay. So this is called Larson versus the Hawaiian Kingdom, where... It took place in the Netherlands from 1999 to 2001. So it says here, Lance Paul Larson, a resident of Hawaii, brought a claim against the Hawaiian Kingdom by its consular regency on the grounds that the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom is in violation of the 1849 Treaty of Friendship, Commerce, and Navigation with the United States, as well as the principles of international law laid down in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties of 1969 and the principles of international comity for allowing the unlawful imposition of American municipal laws, which are domestic laws of America, over Lance Larson's person within the territorial jurisdiction of the kingdom. Now that case explanation or the explanation of this case speaks to the country still existing, the Hawaiian kingdom. And it also identified the Hawaiian kingdom as a state. So this is not about trying to get the United States to recognize this. Because the Hawaiian Kingdom exists and continues to exist since the overthrow of our government by the United States, that's, it, that's what's important to know, right? So if there's any takeaway with regard to what was covered in the last session was the Hawaiian Kingdom exists as a country and that everyone here, including all of you here, we all live in a country called the Hawaiian Kingdom that has been occupied. Now, before I can get straight into the particulars or the circumstance of the American occupation, I needed to piecemeal. I needed to lay things out in a series of PowerPoints that will ultimately lead to the final presentation. Final presentation. So, uh, Gonna, what I'm doing here is I needed to start off with terminology, and that was last session's presentation. Today, I'm going to be getting into what is called, where are you? The political history of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Next session, I'm going to get into what happened in 1893 with the invasion by U.S. Marines, which led to the occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And the final uh, part of this four-part series is now getting into the now what? What do we, what, 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 what is going to, what, what's the, what's the purpose of even knowing this information? And, and that is the culmination of everything, okay? So this session, I'll be covering the political history of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And I'm sure there's a lot of things here that many of you may not have known, but yet we see it every day, okay? So, Bernie, can you tell me, because I can't see you, can you tell me if you can see my PowerPoint? I can. Everybody oh. can see the PowerPoint. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Okay, so here we go. The political history of the Hawaiian Kingdom. 
Now, many of you may have seen that, that, that Union Jack on the flag today, right? Well, it actually goes back to 1794, where Hawaii, and I say Hawaii, not the Hawaiian kingdom, Hawaii, the island, became a British protectorate by agreement between Captain Vancouver and Kamehameha I. And the British ensign was the flag of the kingdom of Hawaii, meaning the island kingdom. In 1816, Kamehameha I ordered the formation of the Hawaiian flag that became the flag of the Hawaiian kingdom. In April of 1810, Kamuali'i, son of Ka'il, king and king of Kauai, recognizes Kamehameha as his superior and is able to retain his reign over Kauai, the kingdom of Kauai. Kamehameha formed the kingdom of the Sandwich Islands that ruled over the former kingdom was kingdoms of Hawaii, Maui, Oahu, and Kauai. Kamehameha was thereafter known as King of the Sandwich Islands. So here is a, a map of the three separate kingdoms, okay? The kingdom of Kauai under Kaumuali'i, the kingdom of Maui under Kaumuali'i's brother Kalanikupule, no, sorry, Kahikili, which later was succeeded by Kalanikupule, and the kingdom of Hawaii under Kamehameha. Kamehameha was able to consolidate these kingdoms in 1795 after the Battle of Nu'uwanu. And then by 1810, when Kamuali'i recognized Kamehameha as his lord, it then became consolidated and known as the Kingdom of the Sandwich Islands. On May 4, 1825, the British Majesty ship, his British Majesty ship, Blanc, under the command of Lord Byron, arrived in Lahaina from London with the bodies of Kamehameha II and Queen Kamamalu. In the hands of Lord Byron, were secret instructions from the British Crown regarding the Sandwich Islands government and actions to be taken with foreign powers if they exerted sovereignty over the islands. Remember, it's a British protector. The instructions in part stated to Lord Byron, you will endeavor to cultivate a good understanding with the government in whatever native hands it may be and to secure by kind offices and friendly intercourse a future and lasting protection for the persons and property of the subjects of the United Kingdom. As my lords have directed that you should be furnished with the voyages of Captains Cook and Vancouver and that of Captain Kotzbu of the Russian Navy and an essay on the commerce of the Pacific by Captain McConaughey, you will be apprised of the position in which these islands stand with regard to the crown of Great Britain and that his majesty might claim over them a right of sovereignty not only by discovery, but by direct and formal session by the natives and by the virtual acknowledgement of the officers of foreign powers. So this is referring to when Kamehameha ceded the island of Hawaii to join the British Empire. His majesty's rights you will, if necessary, be prepared to assert, but considering the distance of the place, and the infant state of political society there, you will avoid, as far as may be possible, the bringing these rights into discussion, and will propose that any disputed point between yourself and any subjects of other powers or countries shall be referred to your respective governments. On June 6, 1824, the Council of Chiefs confirmed Kamehameha II's younger brother, Kawiki Aoli, to be Kamehameha III. But since the young king was only 11 years old, Kahumanu remained regent, which means serving in the absence of a monarch. In the meeting, Kalarimoku, who was serving as prime minister, pointed out defects in the laws of the Hawaii, of Hawaii, especially in regard to the reversion of lands upon the death of a king. See, under the ancient system, when a king dies, all lands held by the chiefs reverted to the successor to be redistributed to, to either the same chiefs or different chiefs. But that process was normally, uh, would normally trigger war because some chiefs wouldn't get what they thought they should. The council agreed to forego the revision 
and the lands remain in the chiefs or their successors, except in times of treason. Lord Byron then submitted eight recommendations to the Council of Chiefs, that the king be head of the people, that all the chiefs swear allegiance, that the lands descend in hereditary succession, that taxes be established to support the king, that no man's life be taken except by consent of the king or regent and 12 chiefs, that the king or regent grant pardons at all times, that all the people be free and not bound to one chief. So this is a, a move toward government reform. Okay? That was very different under the ancient system. And that a port duty or tax be laid on all foreign vessels. On December 7, 1827, Kahumanu called a meeting of the Council of Chiefs, of Chiefs to discuss Kamehameha's session of the islands to Great Britain and to discuss a code of laws for the kingdom. The chiefs understood the British relationship to be comity or on friendly relationships rather than vassalage, meaning under the British. And therefore the council of chiefs, chiefs could make the code of laws without British approval. On December 8, 1827 was the first penal code or criminal code that prohibited murder, theft, adultery, selling of rum, prostitution, and gambling. At a meeting of the Council of Chiefs in 1829, Captain Finch of USS Vincennes heard for the first time the use of the English word Hawaiian. Oh, this is important. Okay, The first time this word called, which is Hawaiian, which is English, Captain Finch heard it for the first time in this meeting of the Council of Chiefs. He states that the government and natives generally have dropped or do not admit the designation of the Sandwich Islands as applied to their possessions, but adopt and use that of Hawaiian in allusion to the fact of the whole group having been subjugated by the first Kamehameha, who is Kamehameha, who was the chief of the principal island of Hawaii, or more modernly, Hawaii. Captain Cook named the group of islands that comprised three separate kingdoms, the Sandwich Islands, after the Earl of Sandwich. What happened there? Yeah. In 1829, the chiefs renamed it to Hawaiian Islands, which in the native language is Ko Hawaii Pai Aina. Ko Hawaii Pai Aina is literally the islands that belong to Hawaii referring to Kamehameha's kingdom of Hawaii as opposed to the kingdom of Maui or Kauai. So Ko is a possessive, Hawaii is a subject, and the islands, Pai Aina, is what is possessed by Hawaii. So it really means the islands that belong to Hawaii or what came to be known as Hawaiian islands. Now, if Kahikili or Kalani Kupule, his son, in uh, succeeded in doing what Kamehameha did in consolidating the Kingdom of Hawaii and the Kingdom of Kauai, then what we would have is Ko Maui Pai Aina, the islands that belong to Maui. Or if uh, Kaeo or his son Kamuali'i did what Kamehameha did, then we would have Ko Kauai Pai Aina, meaning the islands that belong to Kauai. So that's what's important here about that English word Hawaiian is referring to the islands that belong to the Kingdom of Hawaii through conquest. Now, government reform. Upon the death of Kahumanu in 1832, Kamehameha III assumed full control of government and appointed Kinau as his premier. In 1834, a more expansive code was enacted with five chapters. And each chapter was discussed and ratified by the Council of Chiefs according to ancient custom before receiving the king's signature and becoming law. In the kingdom, religion was as much a part of chiefly governance as governance was an extension of religion. When a Catholic missionary party arrived in Honolulu on July 6, 1827, they did not request a license or permission, as did the Protestant missionary party 
in 1820. Since January 3rd, 1830, the Catholic religion was banned by Kahumanu as premier. On September 30th, 1836, after another Catholic priest arrived, Kamehameha III issued an ordinance or law rejecting the Catholic religion on December 18th, 1837. Pursuant to the ordinance or law, followers of the Catholic religion were persecuted and imprisoned. However, on June 17, 1839, Kamehameha III issued orders that no more punishment should be inflicted and that all who were then in confinement should be released. Hearing of the persecution, a French warship command commanded by Captain Laplace arrived in Honolulu on July 9, 1839 from Tahiti. Captain Laplace was prepared to carry out hostilities if the Catholic, Catholic religion was not allowed to be practiced in the kingdom. In addition to allowing the practice of the Catholic faith, Commander III was compelled to sign an unequal treaty with the French captain that imposed jury selection benefits to Frenchmen and a fixed duty or tax on French wine or brandy not exceeding 5%. On October 26, 1839, the American Council sent a letter to Commander III regarding the American missionaries and government. He wrote, Sir, as the opinion seems to be to some extent entertained that American citizens residing in the Sandwich Islands as missionaries under the patronage of an incorporated institution in the United States have exerted a controlling influence upon the framers of the laws of this country, I have very respectfully to inquire if they have ever had any voice in the passage of laws affecting the interests of other foreigners, and particularly whether they have ever had anything to do in the measures adopted by your government for the prevention of the introduction of the Catholic religion into the country. On October 28, 1839, Commander III responded in writing. My respects to you, the American Council. I have received your letter asking questions respecting the American missionaries, supposed by some to regulate the acts of my government under me. I, together with the chiefs under me, now clearly declare to you that we do not see anything in which your questions are applicable to the American missionaries. From the time the missionaries first arrived, they have asked permission or liberty to dwell in these islands, communicating instructions in letters and delivering the word of God has been their business. They were hesitatingly permitted to remain by the chiefs of that time because they were said to be about to take away the country. We exercised forbearance, however, and protected all the missionaries. And as they frequently arrived in this country, we permitted them to remain in this kingdom because they asked it. And when we saw the excellence of their labors, then some of the chiefs and people turned to them in order to be instructed in letters, for those things were, in our opinion, really true. When the priests of the Romish religion, the Catholic religion, landed at these islands, they did not first make known to us their desire to dwell on the islands and also their business. There was not a clear understanding with this company of priests as there was that because they landed in the country secretly without Kahumanu's hearing anything about their remaining here. But that thing which you speak to me of, that they act with us or overrule our acts, we deny it. It is not so. We think that perhaps these are their crimes, their real crimes. They're teaching us knowledge. They're living with us and sometimes translating between us and foreigners. They're not taking the sword into their hand and saying to us with power, stop, punish not the worshipers in the Romish religion. But to stand at variance with and to confine that company, they have never spoken like that since the time of Kahumanu I down to the time that the Romish priest was confined on board the Europa, which was the name of a ship. I think perhaps those things are not clear to you. It would perhaps be proper, therefore, that the American missionary should be examined before you and Commodore Reed and us also. 
So Commitment the Third basically rebuilt this idea that missionaries controlled the kingdom, period. Now, although the Hawaiian kingdom declared the Protestant faith to be the religion of the country in 1824, it learned religious tolerance as a result of its experience dealing with Catholicism. Government reform would include the separation of the church from government. It would also allow Hawaiian commoners to practice the old religion. After being threatened with French aggression, Commander III and its chiefs pursued government reform that sought to establish as well as protect the rights of all its people. According to British General William Miller in 1831, he stated, if then the natives wish to retain the government of the islands in their own hands and become a nation, if they are anxious to avoid being dictated to by any foreign commanding officer that may be sent to this station, it seems to be absolutely necessary that they should establish some defined form of government and a few fundamental laws that will afford security for property and such commercial regulations as will serve for their own guidance as well as for that of foreigners. If these regulations be liberal, as they ought to be, commerce will flourish and all classes of people will be gainers. While unable to secure an instructor for the kingdom and chiefs in government reform, William Richards, a, a, a missionary at that time, accepted an appointment by Commitment III as the instructor. Richards developed the curriculum based upon Hawaiian translations of Professor Francis Whalen's two books, Elements of Moral Science, published in 1835, and The Elements of Political Economy, published in 1837. Richard sought to theorize governance from a foundation of natural rights within an agrarian society, farming, based upon capitalism that was not only cooperative in nature, but also morally grounded in Christian values. On June 7, 1839, Commander III proclaimed and expanded a code of laws preceded by a declaration of rights. The code stated, no chief has any authority over any man any farther than it is given him by specific enactment, and no tax can be levied other than that which is specified in the printed law, and no chief can act as a judge in a case where he is personally interested, and no man can be dispossessed of land which he has put under cultivation except for crimes specified by law. What you're starting to see is the codification of Hawaiian law that previously was separated and distinct within each moku of a high-ranking chief. The following year, on October 8, 1840, Commander III signed into law the first constitution incorporating the Declaration of Rights as its preamble. The function of the Constitution was to lay down the general features of a system of government and to define to a greater or lesser extent the powers of such government in relation to the rights of persons on the one hand and on the other in relation to certain other political entities which are incorporated in the system. As a result of the temporary occupation by the French in 1839, British policy toward the kingdom would change, and this was a game changer. Lord Ingestre, a member of the British House of Commons, called upon the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Viscount Palmerston, to respond. Palmerston was non-committal, but it signaled a change in policy that would be taken up by his successor, Lord Aberdeen. According to the British Admiralty in 1842, Lord Aberdeen, who is the Foreign Affairs Minister, does not think it advantageous or politique to seek to establish a paramount influence for Great Britain in those islands at the expense of that enjoyed by other powers. All that appears to his lordship to be required is that no other power should exercise a greater degree of influence than that possessed by Great Britain. These other powers included the United States, and the French. That was the opening for the Hawaiian Kingdom to pursue formal recognition of Hawaiian independence. So in 1842, Commander III pursued the formal recognition of Hawaiian state sovereignty. To accomplish this, he appointed 
Timoteo Haalilio, William Richards, and Sir George Simpson. While the envoys were on their diplomatic mission, Lord Paulette of the British Navy seized control of the government and occupied the Hawaiian Kingdom on February 25th, 1843. Word of the occupation reached British Admiral Thomas in Braprizo, Chile, and he arrived in the islands on July 25th, 1843. After a meeting with Commander III, the Hawaiian government was restored on July 31st, 1843. At a Thanksgiving service after the ceremony at Kauai Hau Church, Commander III declared, the life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. That park that we have across from uh, um, the new Blaisdell Center okay, called Thomas Square, that is where the Hawaiian flag uh, was risen again and the British after the British flag was lowered. And, and, and that park was named after Admiral Thomas. That's why it's called Thomas Square. Well, the diplomats were able to secure on November 28th a recognition of two of the powers that Lord Aberdeen referred to, the, the, the French and the British where both countries recognized the Hawaiian kingdom. At this time, in Sandwich Islands, they referred to it as an independent state. And then one year later, the third party, the third power, the United States, formally recognized the independence of the Hawaiian kingdom. Now, October 29, 1845, Commander the Third commissioned Robert Wiley of Scotland to be Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jared P. Judd, a former missionary as Minister of Finance, William Richards as Minister of Education, and John Record as Attorney General. Now, this appointment rattled a lot of the people, the commoners in Hawaii, who were concerned with true experience that these foreigners may have ill intent and basically do harm to the country, the Hawaiian Kingdom. Now, before they could take uh, these positions, they all rescinded their former nationality or citizenship, except for Robert Wiley, who was British. He became a dual citizen, which is called a Hawaiian denizen, not a Hawaiian subject. The others became Hawaiian subjects prior to their appointment. So they gave up their allegiance to their former countries of nationality. Now, in a letter published in the newspaper, Commander III addressed the concerns of the people. The people who have learned the new ways I have retained. Here's the name, here's the name of one of them, G.L. Capel, Secretary of the Treasury. He understands the work very well, and I wish there were more such men. Among the chiefs, Leleahoku, Paki, and John Young, Kioniana, are capable of filling such places, and they already have government offices, one of them over foreign officials. And as soon as the young chiefs are sufficiently trained I hope to give them the places, but they are not now able to become speakers in foreign tongues. I have therefore refused the letters of appeal to dismiss the foreign advisors for those who speak only the Hawaiian tongue. John Record, the Hawaiian Attorney General, stated that the laws of Rome, that, that government from which all governments of Europe, Western Asia, and Africa descended, could not be used for Hawaii, nor could those of England, France, or any other country. The Hawaiian people must have laws adapted to their mode of living, but it is right to study the laws of other peoples and fitting that those who conduct law offices in Hawaii should understand these other laws and compare them to see which are adapted to our way of living and which are not. The theory of constitutional monarchy states that the three powers of a modern constitutional monarchy have distinct functions, legislative, executive, judicial, but are not completely separate. As part of an interdependent whole, each power is defined not only by its own particular function, but also by the other powers which limit and interact with it. In 1851, the legislature passed a resolution establishing a commission to revise the 1840 Constitution. The commission adopted the structure and organization of the 1780 Massachusetts Constitution, 
being the most advanced at the time in the world. The revised constitution was approved by the legislature and Commander III signed it into law on June 14, 1852. Remnants of absolute rule, however, remained in order to protect the kingdom from foreign aggression. Article 39 of the 1852 Constitution states that the king, by and with the approval of his cabinet and privy council in case of invasion or rebellion, can place the whole kingdom or any part of it under martial law, and he can ever alienate it. Okay. Notice it doesn't say never, but he can ever alienate, which means he can, if indispensable, to free it from the insult and oppression of any foreign power. Article 45 also says, all important business for the kingdom which the king chooses to transact in person, he may do, but not without the appropriation, which is the approval of the Kuhinanui. The king and Kuhinanui shall have a negative on each other, others on each other's public acts. So this Article 45 says, if they're going to transfer Hawaii to another country to protect it, all it needs is for the king and the premier to agree. It doesn't require the legislature. Okay? So these are remnants of, of absolute authority. Because of the renewed French aggression, the king and premier were forced to consider placing the kingdom under the protection of the United States. Talks of annexation to the United States were negotiated but were never were not successful. With the death of Commander III on December 15, 1854, ended any and all talks of annexation. In a speech to the Hawaiian legislature upon the ascension of Commander IV, the successor to Commander III, Alexander Lijodil, who said the age of Commander III was that of progress and of liberty, of schools and of civilization. He gave us a constitution and fixed laws. He secured the people in their title to their lands and removed the last chain of oppression. He gave them a voice in his councils and in the making of the laws by which they are governed. He was a great national benefactor and has left the impress of his mild and amiable disposition on the age for which he was born. Alexander Leo Leo succeeded to the throne as Kamehameha IV. During his reign, the premier was separated from the Minister of the Interior offices. The Department of Public Instruction was established, came to be known as the Board of Education. And legislative sessions were every two years, biennial, meaning they met every two years. Prior to this, they met every year, which is annually. On November 30th, 1863, Kamehameha IV died. The premier, Victoria Kamamalu, temporarily succeeded to the throne and thereafter proclaimed Lat Kapuaiva as Kamehameha V. Upon ascending to the throne, Kamehameha V did not take the oath of office because he did not approve the constitution. Article 94 states the king, after approving this constitution, shall take the following oath. Both Kamehameha IV and the V, they were brothers, felt that the 1852 constitution had to be amended in order to move forward as a constitutional monarchy because Article 39 and Article 45 still had the remnants of, of absolute control. Article 45 should be removed and leave any changes to the constitutional law solely with the legislative assembly. And Article 94 should mandate the oath of office and not make it a choice to take the oath. And the Constitution should provide for the separation of powers doctrine. Commander V seized the opportunity to make the necessary alterations when he ascended to the throne and called for a constitutional convention of elected delegates. So this is the first constitutional convention in the Hawaiian Kingdom. The elected delegates, nobles, and king met in convention from July 7 to August 8, 1864, and agreed upon all the constitutional changes except for qualifications for elected representatives and those voting for the representatives. The convention was at a deadlock on these electoral provisions. As a result, Commander V, in an act of irony, dissolved the convention and exercised his sovereign prerogative under Article 45 with the approval of the Kuhinanui, 
which was his father, Matayo Kekonawa, and he then annulled the 1852 Constitution. He proclaimed a new Constitution on August 20th, 1864. Along with the electoral qualifications, the office of premier was eliminated, whose check on the actions of the monarch was replaced by the signature of a cabinet minister. Unlike the premier who was not accountable to anyone, the cabinet minister was accountable to the legislative assembly and could be removed by a vote of a lack of confidence or impeachment proceedings. The function of the Privy Council was greatly reduced and the regency replaced the function of the premier. The crown was required to take the oath of office and the legislature became unicameral where the nobles and the representatives sat together Prior to this, they would sit in two separate houses, the House of Nobles and the House of Representatives. And the separation of powers doctrine was fully enshrined in the Constitution, which means the monarch being the chief executive that executes the laws or enforces laws cannot create law. That is only on the responsibility and function of the legislative branch, not the executive branch. In his speech at the opening of the Legislative Assembly in 1864, Kamehameha V explained and justified his action under Article 45 of the 1852 Constitution, which they sought to remove, but as a result, utilized it to bring out the new Constitution. Kamehameha V stated that the 45th article that reserved to the sovereign the right to conduct personally in cooperation with the Kuhinanui but without the intervention of a ministry or the approval of the legislature, such portions of the public business as he might choose to undertake. So what Kamehameha V did was nothing unconstitutional, but it did rely and was based upon the 1852 Constitution, Article 45. Now, under the 1864 Constitution, there was no Article 45. So Kamehameha V was the only king that could have done what he did in a legal way. The 1864 Legislative Assembly appointed a special committee to respond to Commemorative Fitt's opening speech of the new legislature. The committee recognized the constitutionality of his actions and stated this, and stated this prerogative okay, converted into a right by the terms of the 1852 Constitution, your majesty has now parted with both for yourself and successors. And this assembly thoroughly recognizes the sound judgment by which your majesty was actuated to the abandonment of a privilege which at some future time might have been productive of untold evil to the nation. Now on December 11, 1872, Kamehameha V died without naming a successor to the throne. For the first time in Hawaiian history, the legislature would be convened to elect king, uh, to elect a king, and that was William Charles Lunalilo, who was not of the Kamehameha line. King Lunalilo would only reign for one year, after which the legislature was reconvened to elect another monarch. On February 12, 1874, the legislature elected King David Kalakaua. King Lunalilo would only reign for one year, after which the legislature reconvened to elect another monarch. On February, 20, on February 12, 1874, the legislature elected King David Kalakaua. During this special session, the legislature also repealed the property qualifications embodied in Article 61 and 62 of the 1864 Constitution. Now, this is a report okay, of, in 1880 of the, from the president of the Board of Education. And he stated, in part, the system is still in a youthful condition, the Board of Education, and many of the natural outgrowths of foreign systems have not yet been fully or successfully incorporated into it. Among these may be mentioned the systematic examination and grading of teachers, the establishment of normal schools for training teachers and of teachers' institutes, and the full and proper gra uh, gradation of the pupils in the public schools. The results, however, of the past two-year period would seem to indicate the increased interest and confidence of the nation 
in its system of public instruction or public education. This interest is manifested by the popular desire for schools of increased proficiency, by the acknowledgement of the superior efficiency and economy of systems of union and graded schools, by the greater demand for well-qualified teachers, and by the desire for new and better schoolhouses to take the place of the old and dilapidated, dilapidated ones. This progress so satisfactory to the friends of education is evidence that the judgment of the people harmonizes with the liberal educational policy which your honorable body, which is the legislature, has heretofore seen fit to pursue. This harmony is essential to the success of our system of instruction. For experience proves that liberal appropriations and legislative enactments cannot of themselves alone impart to such a system vitality. It must rely also for this upon an enlightened public opinion, itself the result of education by which the people are brought to esteem the proper training of their children, a paramount duty. The Hawaiian kingdom, its literacy rate became second to Scotland. On the moral truths in this, in this report, it's the president states, one great defect of our common school teachers is the lack of inclination or ability to teach their pe pupils moral truths. Our public school system should, like the government which administers it, be non-sectarian and national. Now that's important, non-sectarian, okay? Meaning you don't involve a particular sector or group or religion in teaching. And this is what kept the, uh, the common school teachers on maybe we shouldn't be teaching moral truths because it could be looked upon as Christian or religion. And the board aimed to maintain it free from the influence of church and sect. But this should not prevent the teachers from instructing their pupils in the principles of morality and good behavior and those habits of thought which form the basis of all religious beliefs. So what this shows is the Hawaiian government is also very careful not to blend religion with government, okay? It's a non-sectarian way of running government. Now, between 1880 and 1892, 18 Hawaiian subjects participated in the Hawaiian Youths Abroad Program, where they studied in England, Scotland, Italy, United States, China, and Japan. And here we have a picture of Joseph Kamau Oha, who attended King's College in England. In England, they attended not just only King's College, but also St. Chad's College. And the subjects of instruction included military training, ironworks, medicine, engraving, and sculpture. Also, the founder of modern China, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, attended Iolani College and Oahu College in Honolulu from 1879 through 1883. Dr. Sun Yat-sen's brother, his older brother, was a, was a chef at Ulupalakua Ranch on Maui, who brought his younger brother to the Hawaiian Kingdom to be educated. Now in 1910, Dr. Sun told a reporter in Hawaii, this is my Hawaii. Here I was brought up and educated and it was here that I came to know what modern civilized governments are like and what they mean. Dr. Sun, Dr. Sun Yat-sen is the father of modern China today. He is like China's George Washington and he learned what governments are and how it operates as a constitutional system in the, from the Hawaiian Kingdom through his education. So in closing, the Hawaiian Kingdom is, not was, is a progressive country that espoused the rule of law. The Hawaiian Kingdom literacy was second to Scotland. Aboriginal Hawaiians throughout the islands received universal health care at no charge at Queen's Hospital. And under the 1850 Kuleana Act, which has not been repealed, the commoner can purchase up to 50 acres of government land at 50 cents an acre. Now the inflation calculator says 50 cents in 1850 is $18.99 today. So with that, uh, let me, uh, 
do I un stop sharing? Got it. Okay. So uh, turn it back to you, Vernon, to uh, see if um, there's any questions. Yeah, mahalo, Kano. Um, <clears throat> so, guys, if you have any questions, uh, you can either put it in the chat um, or, or raise your hand. I'll use the raise hand icon thingy at the top, and uh, we'll let you have the floor. Um, I'll start us off with uh, a question or two for you, Dr. Sai. So you <clears throat> you went through the basically the the formation of government, right, um, and laws, um, starting from 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 pre. Kamehameha unifying the islands. Um, and so we went through several different versions, right, of, of, of government. Um, did that structure of the government that you ended with, I, so say pre-1893 overthrow, how different was that to what is maybe even government today? Like was the structure is the structures totally different today than it was then, or is it very similar? Like to talk to us about some of the similarities or or major differences, if any, right? In uh in pre-1893 to post-1893. Well, after 1893, what was imposed in Hawaii till today is the American version of government. So it has nothing to do with the Hawaiian Kingdom, right? Um, even imposed in Hawaii is the American version of capitalism, right? Which is basically uh, 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 very much reliant upon competition and and uh, uh, what is called laissez-faire to a certain degree, minimum government intervention, letting the market determine uh, uh, the mark. Uh, let the market determine. Uh, prices you know, or com uh, price of commodities. That's a very different capitalist system that existed in the Hawaiian Kingdom. The Hawaiian Kingdom was actually a mixed economy where government regulated to a degree capitalism. But the, the understanding of capitalism in the kingdom, which is my great grandparents' era, they were born in the kingdom in 1880s. It was, it was infused with morality, which is kind of interesting, right? And cooperative capitalism. That's what allowed, that type of a political economy is what allowed the Hawaiian government to subsidize Queens Hospital so that Native Hawaiians would have access to Queens Hospital and healthcare free of charge. After 1893, the takeover, the United States by 1906 they repealed that provision of Hawaiian law because they said it was race-based. And from 1906, be, you began to see the native Hawaiians' health decline to where we are now because they did not have access to, to uh, medical care or medicine like they did before. And the only time native Hawaiians would go to the hospital is when it's too late because they didn't have health insurance. That has been ongoing. So a lot of what we have today in this American system, it has nothing to do with the Hawaiian kingdom system. They're very different. And, and I'll be getting into the particulars of that, 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 that takeover and control in the next session, uh, the, the presentation I'll give, looking at what happened in 1893 and, and the consequences. Hello. Um, I have one here. Uh, why is the subject of Hawaiian history not taught in detail? Oh. Sorry, I was muted. Sorry, my bad. Um, thank you for that that answer, um, Dr. Sai. I got a question here. Why is the subject of Hawaiian history not taught in detail today? Well, that was part of my my uh, presentation the last time, um, dealing with terminology. Well, 
uh, Hawaiian academics uh, from the 1980s to date have all been arguing, which is false, that the American missionaries controlled the Hawaiian kingdom. Right? Uh, uh, Professor Kamele Hiva, who, who, who wrote her dissertation, which eventually came, became a book called Native Lands and Foreign Desires, basically blamed the Haole for controlling Kamele III and the Mahele. Well, actually, uh, Kamele Hiva's research was completely uh, uh, wrong. <laughs> uh, she spent more time trying to attack Haoles than explaining the Mahele. And her explanation of the Mahele was completely wrong, completely wrong. So you also have Professor John Osorio, whose dissertation eventually became the book, Dismembering Lahui, where he says that the white men took over the legislature in 1851 completely false, made up, right? Now, those two books have become foundational <laughs> in research projects by Native Hawaiians, whether academics or others outside, who always start off with the Mahele was bad. The Hawaiian legislature was controlled by the Americans, blah, blah, blah. It's all wrong. So what they what they promote is an alternative view of the facts regarding the Hawaiian kingdom and say we're indigenous people, that the kingdom was never Hawaiian, but controlled by the Haole. Wrong, right? Colonization. The United States colonized Hawaii. No, you can't colonize another country, but you can occupy another country. So, so I'm here at the University of Hawaii. They're still teaching that false narrative. And I basically say, tell, tell my students, don't take their classes because it already has been falsified, right? And that's the key. And the thing about research at the University of Hawaii, you're not supposed to defend your, you're not supposed to uh, uh, have your research become your territory you got to protect. If there is information that was not known before, but alters certain research, those academics have to adjust. That's how it works. So if people can show through academic research that I was mistaken on a particular point in my analysis, I have to adjust. If I don't, it's unprofessional because it's supposed to be based on qualitative research, not rhetoric, trying to argue a point, right? So that's why it's not being taught. But it is being taught in, in, in certain areas like myself teaching this in the College of Education graduate program, and also in political science courses at Winwick Community College and Hawaiian Studies. But there's also a lot of professors in the community college uh, system that are teaching this and have gotten their PhDs in areas that address and, 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 and deal with the fact that we're occupied, but now they're getting into particulars which I didn't get into. So a good example would be uh, uh, Professor Lawrence Gunscher, who's a political scientist and he's German, but he got his PhD at UH Manoa when I was there. And he focused on Hawaiian Kingdom foreign relations. And it was a formidable, formidable force in the 19th century that he covered. And his book has been published by UH Press. That undermines so much of what is being taught at the University of Hawaii. Yeah, so it's it's important to 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 spot this, and I actually came up with an article published in Volume Three of the Hawaiian Journal of Law and Politics uh, last year, called "Setting the Record Straight on Hawaiian Indigeneity," meaning you know what, let's call it. And this is not about us against them. It's not me being a Native Hawaiian against Native Hawaiians. I'm saying if you're saying that this is a that this cell phone is a Toyota, I'll call you on it. It's not a Toyota, it's a cell phone. And stop calling it a Toyota. <laughs> it really gets down to that, right? Now, with 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 young students learning this information, it has to be accurate. We have to deal with that misinformation. And that's where uh, things are taking place at the University of Hawaii right now that I'm a part of.
So uh, what you folks are getting here is, is research that has been vetted. And uh, in fact, I have, uh, I just finished with the copy editor for Oxford University Press on a book to be published by Oxford University Press called Unconquered States, uh, Non-European Powers in the Age of Imperialism. And there's chapters in this book uh, on Persia of the 19th century, which is Iran, Thailand, uh, Japan, China, the Hawaiian Kingdom, Tonga. And these are unconquered states that still exist. So, so to now have that come out, out of Oxford University Press has taken our history to another level, at that level that has a reach across the globe. So it all begins with making sure that um, research is accurate and also subjected to peer review. You just don't write something and promote it at the academic level. It has to be vetted, right? So when I sit on doctoral committees, my job is not to agree with the doctoral student. My job is to poke holes in the research to see if that doctoral student can defend the research, not argue it. And if they can defend it successfully, then you get your PhD. That's how it's supposed to work. Okay. So um, this sounds like it might be leading into this, this next question. Um, two, two questions maybe, Keanu. Um, First one is, with that being said, how was the formation of Hawaiian government unique in the world? And second, you, you mentioned Dr. Sun Yat-sen and his influence. Was there other countries that was influenced by this unique Hawaiian government? Uh, Tonga. In fact, uh, King Tupou actually adopted portions of the Hawaiian Kingdom Constitution of 1864 for his country, right? And Tonga eventually became a British protectorate like the Hawaiian Kingdom and later became an independent state. So uh, the Hawaiian Kingdom also had influence with uh, Fiji, uh, Samoa. And this was, and this is part of uh, Professor Lauren Gunsher's uh, research and his book published by the University of Hawaii Press uh, uh, the Hawaiian Kingdom, a, a, a power in the world. So he actually documents all of that. So that's pretty impressive. And it showed that, that the country, the Hawaiian Kingdom, was looked up to by all Polynesians, which is quite different today because Hawaiians are, also, are, are instead looking up to other Polynesians to be like them. In fact, it was reversed, right? They all looked up to the Hawaiian Kingdom and its policies and so forth. But the reason why we are trying to look out to other Polynesians to be like them is because we were led to believe that the Hawaiian kingdom was controlled by the Haole and the Americans and it's not ours and we have to create our own, right? So this is what, what, what uh, education and information provides is informed decision-making. And that's what's important. So it's not trying to promote the Hawaiian kingdom as a, hey, we're great. No, it's just presenting the Hawaiian kingdom for what it was and what it still is. Now, as far as uh, the economy and universal healthcare, free healthcare, if you look at many countries in Europe and the Nordic countries, Finland, Sweden, they provide free healthcare, but that only started after World War II. In the Hawaiian Kingdom, it actually started back in 1859 when Queen's Hospital was established. That was its purpose. You know, so when you start to look at how progressive the Hawaiian Kingdom was as a country, it's quite mind-blowing, really mind-blowing. But, you know, you have to stop that misinformation being spread by our own people at the academic level. And they got to be held accountable because too long have our people been fed the wrong information? They need to be informed, be informed with the right information to make informed decisions in whatever those decisions that need to be made. That's what's important. And I'm a big promoter of critical thinking. Students have to be taught how to critically think, 
Now, to be a critical thinker, that doesn't mean to critique. <laughs> critical thinking means asking the right questions, right? That's a critical thinker. Ask the right questions. Not necessarily you got the answer, but you're asking the right questions. You're not saying, oh, the how you control the kingdom and you're trying to critique it, but there's no basis for it. So if somebody says, oh, the Mahele, it was bad. My response is, explain why it was bad. Just don't say it was bad. And then I come to find out they can't explain it. They just say, well, that's what my professor told me. <laughs> but that's not critical thinking. That's just accepting something of what somebody else said and parroting it. And to me, that's a problem. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, um, we're Mahalo Nui, Dr. Sai. We'll, we'll end it there. We, I look forward to the next, um, uh, the next part in this series. Uh, Dr. Sai mentioned uh, Lawrence Goncher. Uh, guys, just FYI, we're hoping to have him uh, present to us as well um, as part of our series uh, in following up to Dr. Sai. Um, and if there are no more questions, guys, I'm going to have um, Pele close us in prayer and uh, we'll dismiss everybody for the evening. Oya mahalo nui o ka sai ka nui o ko ike mahalo nui ia ah mahalo nui e ka ohana kana ka po wai ka hui ano o ka ko ike po ne pani ka ko ya ike hui ano o ka ko makapule po alu ana ka pule ka ohane ka amene mako ka wa pule amene 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 aloha nui mahalo 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 okay everybody um everybody be safe. And uh, we see you folks soon. Ahoy ho. <laughs>